Good morning. We are studying the book of First Peter. We've introduced the book and got a little bit into the text last Sunday. <clears throat> what is the theme of this book? I would say fellowship. Fellowship. Uh, fellowship discussed a lot. Uh, what what major major theme is Peter hit on? It's 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 every single chapter. Suffering. Um, we we use the the expression faith under fire. Uh, some folks have used that expression. Uh, staying with it, staying faithful even in the midst of suffering. Uh, again, written somewhere around. A, Nero's persecution was somewhere around, it began somewhere around 64. Uh, most scholars will say the book was written 64, 65 ish AD. So it's, it's kind of written, you can tell as the book is, at least to me, it seems to me that when you read the book, the suffering is already, or the persecution is already going on. But it also seems when you read the book that Peter is. It's almost like he's saying, brace yourself, because it's going to get worse. And, and you need to stay faithful, you need to stay the course. And so that's kind of, uh, if, if you had to pick one theme of the book, uh, we could name a lot of different themes that are discussed and, and a lot of times hit on pretty heavily. But if I had to pick just one theme, that would be it. Stay faithful in the midst of this persecution or faith under fire, however you want to uh, word that. That's the theme. I don't think I mentioned this in the introduction. Uh, he, he mentions, uh, it, well, it, I don't know about necessarily introduction, but in the beginning where he says, strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Uh, where is that now? Modern day. Turkey. Who said that? That's Peggy. Are you a geography person? <laughs> that's pretty good. I didn't, I didn't expect anybody to know that. Um, that's, uh, I didn't know that until I was, I just didn't even think about it really. I was, uh, I was looking over some more notes and I said, oh yeah, I, I didn't even think about where that would be modern day time. Sometimes we, we forget to uh, think about that. And so that's where it is in, in our day and age. It'd be in the area of modern day Turkey. But we, we got into the text verses uh, one and two. Let me tell you something that I like. Uh, to do, and I think this is helpful in Bible study, if, if you're going through personal Bible study, sometimes people will tell me, uh, what, version, uh, what version of the Bible do you recommend? I, I, I can tell you without hesitation, there is one version I recommend uh, above, before, and beyond all others, and that is the one you will read, and the one you will study. Uh, however, obviously, certain versions have advantages, disadvantages, pros, cons, some things are handled better, some things not quite as good. Uh, I don't think there's any one perfect translation. I'm going to say, well, you know, I thought we said the Word of God is perfect. The Word of God is perfect, uh, but when, when translating, there are strengths and there are weaknesses. Uh, that's not a, a shortcoming on God's part. Uh, even, even with the strengths and weaknesses of various translations, we have so many tools available that it's not like there's any verse or meaning of any verse that is obscured from us that we can't know what that said in the original. Uh, I won't rehearse the how we got the Bible study of, of how many thousand, over, well over 5,000 manuscripts growing all the time as they dig in the Middle East and places like that, archaeological digs. Uh, it, it may be getting towards 6,000 now, who knows, but, it, but well over 5,000 uh, manuscripts of the New Testament. And so it's the most well-attested book in the world but sometimes uh, a particular translation gets something a little bit better than another. So I don't say just one particular translation. A lot of times when I'm preaching, most of the time when I'm preaching, teaching, uh, I'm using the King James, that's what I'm using here. Uh, a lot of times I can think of a verse, I can remember the wording from the King James because I've used that so long. And so that's a lot of times how if I'm, if I'm looking for something, I say, you know, that reminds me of something uh, that I read and... Uh, I need to look up the wording of it, and so I can, uh, even if I use a Bible program, I can search the wording based on the King James. So uh, that's kind of, um, I guess, habit as, as much as anything. In fact, you, I get used to a certain Bible, and I can sometimes remember, I read something about this in Isaiah, 
And I don't remember where, but I know it was on the left-hand page, right column. <laughs> and so sometimes that can help me narrow it down and find what I'm looking for. But, but I say all that to say there are, there are multiple versions. And when you're studying a book, like we're studying First Peter, I think you would do yourself a huge favor to look at the text. Maybe if you know, this week we're studying chapter 1, look at the text of chapter 1, maybe going into chapter 2, and read it in the King James. Read it in the New King James. Uh, go find another translation, maybe New American Standard. That's a, that's a good one that I like. Uh, the English Standard Version or the ESV. Uh, that's a, a very good one as well. But read it in multiple translations and that helps you uh, get, a, get a better overall grasp. But um, what I like, I just recently purchased an ESV. I want to do my uh, reading through the Bible next year in the ESV. I'm going I'm to try that just because uh, I want to read through a different translation. So I'm going to use the ESV, but one thing that I like about this, and I think it helps as a preacher, but it also helps just any Bible student. The ESV, and, and it's not flawless, it's not inspired, but they break the text down into paragraphs. Uh, that's helpful because, you know, sometimes we get so hung up on chapter and verse, which is very helpful because uh, in the sense of if I want to say, you know, the Lord said not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father. And I'm trying to make a point to somebody that it's more than just calling on the Lord verbally. You've got to do what he says do. Well, they say, well, where is that found? Matthew 7, 21. Uh, so in that sense, chapter and verse is, is very helpful. But sometimes, you know, the chapters break right in the middle of a paragraph. I don't know why. I don't know who did that. Um, but, you know, sometimes it, it does that. Sometimes a verse, uh, I see it in the King James all the time, sometimes a verse stops mid-sentence. And I'm like, what's, what's the deal with that? So I think a version that has paragraph divisions is highly recommended. The American Standard Version of 1901 does this. Uh, the, the, um, my, my biggest drawback from the American Standard is that it is so literal, it is so word for word in its translation that it's almost choppy to read at times, uh, but you're hard-pressed to beat it as far as word-for-word -word literal translation. But the ESV does this, and so I, I sometimes I will mention paragraph divisions and things like that. that I, if I do that and I forget to mention it, it'll be based on the ESV because I've, I've looked at a lot of this based on that, and I just think that's extremely helpful when you're studying a particular book of the Bible. Uh, I, if we're not careful, we can rip a passage out of its context and, and make it even sometimes twist it to mean something that it, it doesn't mean at all. I mean, what do you see at the football games all the time? People hold up a sign, John 3.16. And, and what they're saying is, you know, the, you know that, that, that little sign that says John 3.16 says a whole lot uh, to them because it's saying, hey, read this. If you believe in Jesus and you accept him into your heart, you can be saved. Uh, that's what they're trying to say by that. But that's not what John 3.16 teaches. Not even close. And, and what they've done in that is they have lifted it from its context. And, and it's, in fact, it's in the very context of John 3, 3 through 5, which talks about what? Baptism. The new birth, baptism. Uh, you know, Jesus says you, a man must be born again. Uh, and that's not just talking about baptism, it's also talking about a, a change that happens in our lives, and we call that repentance. I'm not the same person I used to be, but, but you lift it out of context, and it's something totally different, but within that paragraph or that thought that Jesus is talking about with Nicodemus, he says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so uh, the, the paragraph division is very helpful, and I wanted to mention that because I hadn't mentioned that up to this point. Uh, you know, it might be the ESV, it might be the ASV, whatever, but I think you're very, very, you would be very, very benefited if you get a version and use it when you're studying through a book to, to look at passages within their paragraph of thought. Uh, if I want to preach from a passage, uh, I, you know, some, some verses you can look at just the verse and you say, boy, there's a sermon right there in that verse. Uh, you know, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scriptures given by inspiration of God, profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness. I mean, there you go. That's a four-point sermon right there. But a lot of times if I want to preach on a passage, I'm going to look at it by a paragraph. I'll say, what, what's he saying right here? And then I'm going to get beyond the paragraph and say, what's he saying in this, uh, in this larger thought 
uh, and then get beyond that and say, what's he saying in this book? Uh, and then beyond that, why is God including this in the Bible? And so, you know, there, there's a lot to consider there. But the paragraphs, I can't emphasize that enough. I think that is uh, really, really good and helpful. Verses 1 and 2 form your first paragraph in 1 Peter. This would be kind of like the greeting paragraph. He's, he's greeting them, uh, refers to them as strangers and pilgrims. Uh, the, the audience is some Jewish. I, I don't think there's any question that there's some Jewish audience because he's going to make references in the Old Testament. In fact, he'll do it right here in chapter 1. But the audience is, is also, and I think maybe more predominantly, Gentile uh, because just because of the location but also you'll know he's at least addressing some Gentiles because, again, right here in chapter 1, he's going to make reference to things about how you walked in your former lust in ignorance. Uh, that's, off, that's a term often used uh, toward the Gentiles, not in a derogatory way by the inspired writers. They're not saying, well, you know, these Gentiles are just a bunch of dummies. They're saying they're ignorant in the sense that they didn't have God's special written covenant. They didn't have that special relationship. They didn't have God's direct revelation given to them in the form of the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, and what we would call the Torah, the books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, even all the prophetic writing, the Psalms, and so on. He said they were ignorant of all that. Not that that made it okay for them to act the way they did, and that's what Paul talks about in Romans chapter 1. But that's a, a, a phrase that's often used of the Gentiles. But he, he goes into, uh, some writers call it a, a doxology here in verses 3 through 9. That would be kind of your next paragraph uh, in the chapter. In verses 3 through 9, he's going to talk about being born again to a living hope. Uh, let, let's look at that and then we'll make some comments on the verses. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively or a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations, suffering, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen, you love, and whom, though... Now you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end, the goal, the ending point of your salvation, of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Now, it's all based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's, that's the end of verse 3 there. Everything that we have to look forward to, all of the, uh, the hope that we have as Christians, is based on the resurrection of Jesus, because without that, you've got nothing. And that's what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. There were people in the church at Corinth who were questioning the resurrection. And Paul says, if Jesus is not raised from the dead, your faith is in vain. You're yet in your sins. And you might as well eat, drink, and be merry because this life is all there is if Jesus is not resurrected. But he is resurrected. And of course he goes on and proves that. And he says, based on that, uh, we ought to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Everything that we have to look forward to is based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, here's one of those places where Peter mirrors the language of Paul, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, sounds like Ephesians 1, 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Uh, you know, again, Peter's not copying Paul. Paul's not copying Peter. It's, it's, a, it's a typical greeting for one thing, but Peter does sometimes mirror Paul's language, not because they're copying each other or, or getting together and deciding what they're going to write, but it's, it's the same spirit who's inspiring the message. So, of course, there's going to be similarities. But uh, I love verse 3 because it, it's a living hope. It, it's, it's not a dead hope. One fellow said, uh, we don't have a hopeless end. What we have is an endless hope as children of God. Huge difference. You see, some people go through this life like it's just a hopeless end. And, and, you know, they say, better grab all the gusto you can while you're here in this life because after this, it's over. And if that were true, after this, it's over, I suppose there might be something to that. But we have, we have evidence that points us to the 
uh, the demanded conclusion that there is a God. He is real. He is alive. He's given us his word. This, this book, uh, there's no other way to explain it other than it came from God. And I don't have to have a hopeless end. If I live this life and lose my soul, well, that is a hopeless end. It, it's an ongoing, you know, Jesus tells us that hellfire is, is everlasting, it's eternal. And that's a, that's a frightening thought, but I don't have to be afraid of that because I can have an endless hope in Christ Jesus. And so that's what Peter points out to them. Hey, you know, the implication in this verse seems to be that for some maybe hope may have died when Jesus died on the cross. And, and again, I can understand that. If you are a disciple of Jesus... You followed him. He he said these things, hinting at his death and hinting at the kingdom. But maybe you haven't understood them as even his own apostles, who are with him every day, they didn't understand. And now all of a sudden, this man that you've said, you know, he, I mean, he opens the eyes of the blind, he opens the ears of the deaf, uh, the dumb speak, lepers are healed, people are raised from the dead. This has to be the Messiah. This has to be the Christ. And then maybe one early one morning, somebody comes and says, have you heard the news? And what, No, what? They have arrested Jesus. Who? The Jewish leaders. He's, he's on trial. They're, they're wanting to crucify him. Maybe you are confused. Some people, no doubt, even jumped in and said, let's go down there and see. And maybe, maybe getting caught up in mob mentality, maybe deciding, oh, yeah, clearly he's not the Christ. I mean... He, he came into Jerusalem with all this pomp and circumstance. The people were crying, Hosanna to the king. And, and what does he do? Nothing. He doesn't come in here and throw off Roman oppression. He, he, he's not the Christ. And in fact, he's an imposter. Crucify him. I don't know. Different reasons, I suppose, for different folks. But all of a sudden, he's crucified. And maybe you're one of those who's kind of confused. And maybe you're not necessarily in the crowd shouting, crucify him. But as you, as you look on the cross, maybe even from a distance, and you see him there, and you say, you know, maybe you walk away from Golgotha, I don't know, just sort of sad, depressed, and you say, you know, I, I thought he was the one. When Jesus talks to those men on the road to Emmaus, now that's similar to what they said. They said, we, we, thought, we thought he was the Christ. And, and on top of that, it's been three days. You know, they were even starting to kind of connect the dots about the resurrection. I said, but, but you know, it's been three days. Of course, they don't realize they're talking to Jesus, the Messiah, who's resurrected from the dead. They'll realize it later. But it's easy to see how a disciple's hope could have been killed when Jesus was killed. And so Peter says, no, you're not, you're not serving a dead Savior. You don't have a dead hope. It, he is alive, and because of that, your hope is alive. And so just as Jesus was resurrected, no doubt many of their hopes began to be resurrected, their faith began to be resurrected as they learned of this. But he goes on, he talks about the inheritance. I love the language that's used here because uh, one, one person said it's a, uh, if I can find it in my notes here, anti-negative language. In other words, he's going to use negative terms to describe heaven. Here's the thing. He says, in so many words, and the Bible does this in a lot of places, it's like it'll try to give us pictures, a street of gold, uh, walls of jasper and things. And we know none of that's literal because heaven's a spiritual place. It's not a physical place. But it's trying to help us to understand in our terms that we might be able to kind of get a little glimpse, just a teeny perception of how great heaven's going to be, how magnificent, how beautiful heaven's going to be. But here's an occasion, and there are other occasions as well, where it's almost like Peter, by inspiration, says, it's too good for me to describe, to give you terms to describe it, so the best I can do is to tell you what it's not. And then he proceeds to tell us what? It's not corruptible. I mean, remember when you, when you get a brand new car? Maybe you've, maybe you've ever had a brand new car. I, I was a fool once and, and bought a brand new car. I got conned into it. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't go there to buy a new car. I went to buy a used car, and I got, uh, I got talked into it. And so uh, that's the only new car I've ever owned in my life, and I got upside down in debt because of it. And I, I said, I don't know if I'll ever buy a new car again. 
But, you know, there's something exciting about driving off the lot with that brand new vehicle. But you know, it doesn't take much time. Something is going to go wrong. It may not be anything major, but they tend to break down. The tires wear out, the brakes wear out, th things like that. Uh, maybe you got a new house, moving into a new house. Sometimes people even will build a house just exactly I like they want, they get to pick this and pick that and they, they get everything and it's exciting to move into that new house and say, here we are, it's done, man, this is great. And then before long, guess what? Something's going wrong with that house. It's just the nature of things here on this earth. They wear out. We hold that new baby and we just, we sit there and we just smile and maybe even shed tears of joy and we say, man, he is perfect. She's perfect. And then, Time begins to wear on and get older and older and the body starts wearing out. Can't do things at 40, 50, 60 years old that you did when you were 20. And, and you know, yeah, I'm, I'm getting at an age where you learn that the hard way, <laughs> that you can't do the things that you did when you were younger. I had an elder at Childersburg. And sometimes he'd come in, you know, kind of sore and say, man, you, you okay, brother? He'd say, yeah, I'm just I'm hurting all over. I'd say, what, what happened? And his wife would kind of smile and say, he, he needed a reminder that he's not 25 anymore. And, and he got it. And he's being reminded. And he's going to be reminded for the next few days because he got out and played sports or something. Uh, but, you know, that's just the nature of it. Things break down on this earth. They corrupt. Metal rusts. Things wear out. Peter says, not so in heaven. It, it's an inheritance that is incorruptible. It's undefiled. It's not defiled. People, you know, deface things with graffiti. Sometimes things get defiled just, again, with use. You know, you, you go out and you use clothes, and what happens? They get dirty. Now, not, not only are they going to wear out, they're going to get dirty. If you're out and about and doing yard work and things like that, they're going to get dirty. And eventually they need to be replaced. Heaven will never need to be replaced because it will never be defiled. It will never be corrupted. What else does he say? Incorruptible, undefiled, it doesn't fade away. It's not going anywhere. And not only that, it's reserved in heaven for you. Peter says, here's what you're aiming for. This is the goal. This is what we're striving for. He goes on in, in verse 5 and he says, uh, who are kept, you, going back to the end of verse 4 there, you Christians are the ones who are kept, guarded, the ESV has that and that's the idea, guarded, you're guarded by the power of God. Now tell me, if God's power is guarding you, who can mess with you? Who can hurt you? This Again, remember, this is written to saints who are starting to suffer, and it's going to get a lot worse. He says, you are kept. We sometimes even use the expression, in the hollow of his hand. He says, you're, you're kept, you're guarded by the power of God. It's a military term in the Greek. He says, God's your general, and he's going to take care of you. That's not a promise that you're never going to suffer in this life, that bad things are never going to happen. But it's a promise that if you stay with him, he can make sure everything, and he will make sure everything works out in the end. By the power of God, through obedient faith. In other words, Peter is saying, hang in there. But notice what he says. It's to be revealed in the last time, the last dispensation, as compared to patriarchal age and the Mosaic age, now being the Christian age, the last dispensation. It's not yet revealed. It's not, it's not yet time. Uh, it's going to be revealed. So, so do, don't be disappointed that you don't see it yet. That's what Peter essentially is saying. Don't, don't be disappointed that you don't see it. Maintain your hope. He's going to guard you in the end. He's going to take care of us. And he says, verse 6, you're, you're greatly rejoicing in this, though for a season, for a time, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptation, suffering. It, it, may, be, it may be that for a time you're going to suffer. But hang in there. It reminds us of uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 16. Paul talks about our light affliction, which is but for a moment, working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are unseen. Because the things which are seen are what? Temporal. The things which are not seen are eternal. And he goes on and he says, If our earthly house, we know, if our earthly house of this tabernacle were destroyed, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. The contrast there, he says, suffering, eternal weight of glory. 
What's, what's better? A moment of suffering? Even if I suffered all my earthly existence, put next to eternity, it's just a blip on the radar. It's nothing. We got to keep our focus. And so Peter says, hang in there. Verse 7 is interesting. The trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes though it be tried with fire. This is, this is obviously figurative language. But you have to wonder also if maybe there's something in Peter's mind here because Roman historian Tacitus tells us that Nero did, in fact, burn Christians, sometimes alive, in his garden. Sometimes they would be covered with tar and lit, and he would hang them, impale them on a stake, and put them in the garden and, and entertain guests and have parties as he burned Christians. Um, Nero was... There's not much you can say. He was just a wicked, wicked person. Uh, there were a lot of Roman emperors who were. You know, do, some, do some historical research on Nero. This guy was unbelievable. Uh, I mean, we have some wicked leaders in our time. There's no doubt. Some immoral, ungodly people that just, to me, uh, embarrass our nation. But hey, looking at Nero, boy, you, you just say, boy. Uh, this, this is the man, I don't know if you remember, we mentioned a while back, but he, he married a young boy at one point. Married a young boy, just out in the open. He was, just, he was open about it. And, of course, this cruelty that he did to Christians. So the language is figurative in verse 7, there's no doubt. But I just, I just sort of wondered, is maybe, maybe he's uh, got that in mind. He, he mentions in verse 8, you know, having not seen, talking about Jesus, um, you love him, uh, though now you do not see him, Yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Here's the interesting thing. Peter had seen, right? He saw Jesus every day. And, of course, he saw the resurrected Christ. And so Peter ha had seen, but he appreciates the faith of those who have not seen. And yet they're, they're clinging to their faith, even in the midst of this suffering that is beginning. And it's like Peter saying, I'm proud of you. But I want you to get ready because it, it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. And, and you need to hang in there. But he says, I, I'm, I'm proud of you because you, you haven't seen Jesus. You haven't seen the resurrected Christ. But you believe. You love him. You serve him. And of course, isn't that what Jesus said to Thomas? John 20, 29. And because you've seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who will believe even though they don't see. Uh, so again, here's... This joy that over and over again, even in the midst of all this suffering, Peter's going to tell them, rejoice, joy. Uh, you know, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. He's going to say over in chapter 4. So uh, joy is a theme here. And then verse 9, he says, receiving the end or the telos in the Greek, the goal of your faith. Uh, it's, it's the finish line is what we might say if you wanted a, a, a metaphor in English. This, this word, it... it, it of course, it can have various meanings, but typically it means the idea of a finish line. When you reach the finish line in a race, you are, well, you're finished, right? You're done. And so that's the finish line for Christians, the salvation of your souls. When he begins in, in verse 10, of course, getting back to verse 9, one thing I want to mention there, that, that listen, if you've got faith, in other words, acknowledging God's existence, that's, that's commendable, I suppose. But if the faith doesn't lead to salvation, what good is it? I mean, the devils believe and tremble. James talks about that in James 2. What good is faith if it doesn't lead me to obey God and, and to be saved? So that's the end of faith. The, the finish line of faith is the salvation of your souls. Now, in verse 10... It's very obvious here, as it begins a new paragraph, that Peter is a student of the prophets. This is a very interesting little section of, of 1 Peter to me. This will go verses uh, 10 to 12 in this little paragraph. He says, of which salvation, talking about our salvation, this would include you and me if we're Christians, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Now, wait a minute, they're prophesying. Why are they inquiring and searching diligently? They, they gave the prophecy. Well, read on. Searching what or what manner of time, not, not time as far as, you know, the time when you're watched. That would be chronos, 
in the Greek. This is a, a different word, and I'm going to have to cheat here and find it because I just forgot what the word is. Kairos. Uh, in the English, it would be K-A-I-R-O-S, Kairos. Uh, but it means a, a period of time, uh, like a time in history, we might say. So searching water, what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them, the prophets, did signify when it, the Spirit, testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Well, again, they're searching. Or what? What is this about? What time period are we prophesying about? Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, the prophets, but unto us, you and me, if we're Christians, and to the Peter, people to whom Peter's writing directly, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Look, the Old Testament prophets, they didn't understand the message at times. Sometimes I used to wonder when I was a little younger and I would study some of the prophets and I would think, I mean, does, does he know? You know, maybe in your Bible, I, I've got, uh, not this Bible, but one I used to use when I was in preaching school, the one that's falling apart. It, it, it has a star beside Messianic passages. Now, that's not inspired. Some of those are starred, and I've, got, I've scribbled it out because it's clearly not a Messianic passage. But some of them are blatantly Messianic. You think about Isaiah 53, as he writes about a man being led as a lamb to the slaughter. Did Isaiah know that? Know who that was? Oh, that's Jesus. Not based on 1 Peter 1. They didn't even fully understand it. Now, they understood some. They understood God's bringing a Savior. He's bringing a Messiah. But, I mean, you even see Peter in Acts chapter 2, and in, I mean, uh, Acts chapter 10, and in Galatians 2. Even Peter's not getting it completely. That God's bringing in a Messiah who's going to save Jews and Gentiles. And they, they constantly resist that. Oh, I, I, I can't rise and kill. Lord, I've never eaten anything common or unclean. Uh, I've got to separate myself from these Gentiles over in um, Galatians 2 when Paul confronts him to the face in Antioch. I've got to separate myself because these, these Gentiles, I, I can't, be, can't be rubbing elbows with them. They're, they're not getting it. So they didn't fully understand all that to say, do you think maybe, just maybe, that you and I take for granted sometimes the glory of the dispensation in which we live? I, I can only speak for one person, that's me. And I, I can tell you without hesitation, there are times I take it for granted. And I read a passage like this and I think, wow. I mean, they're prophesying at times, and going, what does it mean, Lord? And God is saying, just right. It's, it's all going to be revealed in due time. That's why Paul talks about the mystery of the faith sometimes. It's not because, oh boy, it's such a mystery, we can't, we can't figure this thing out. It's because it, at one time it was enshrouded in mystery, and it's being revealed by God. And now, in the gospel age, it's revealed. And we see it. Isn't that amazing? I think we take that for granted sometimes. And I mean, it's hard to get folks sometimes to read their Bibles. Appreciate what you have in your possession. Not only the fact that all that was gone through, uh, all that people went through to give us the Bible in written form and to have it so readily accessible, but the fact that it's the mystery laid open, laid bare for us. And not only that, what does the end of verse 12 say? Which things the angels desire to look into. This is the same word in the Greek. That I don't know if I have that in my notes or not. But um, I don't. But I can't remember what the word is in the Greek. But it's the same word that's used when Peter and John come to the tomb in John chapter 20. And, and it, it says, I always thought it was humorous. John, John tells how he outran Peter to the tomb. Um, but John gets there first. But when Peter gets there, it says he looked. But it's not just the idea of look. There, 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 I think, I'm thinking at least three different Greek words that I can remember for look or see. It's not the word just, you know, oh, you know, somebody shouts over here and I look. Who is that? It, it's it's a, a Greek word that typically will mean, it's the idea of stooping down. You know, maybe you see something on the floor and you say, what is that? So you stoop down to take a better look. That's the idea of this word. 
Same words used over here in 1 Peter. Which things angels desire to look into? If you ever see, and I, I forgot to do this, I was going to steal a picture off of Josh Clevenger's PowerPoint, uh, and I don't think he would mind. But if you ever look at a picture of the mercy seat in the old Jewish uh, tabernacle, of course, later in the temple, but went in the most holy place, if you remember from Josh's sermon, maybe you can remember that. But if you ever see a picture of the mercy seat, what is the posture of the angels? They're, they're stooping. If, it's kind of like, a, it's almost like they're, they're bent over. And I can't remember if they're on their knees, but, but it's like they're stooping. Of course, the wings are up, but they're stooping. And they're, it's like they're looking into the ark. I think there's a reference back to that here. Which things the angels desired to look into. Even the angels from heaven are peering over, as it were. And again, heaven's a spiritual place. There's no banister or railing or whatever that they can peer over and look down on earth. But just picture that in your mind for, to bring it home. Here they are peering over down to earth and they're going, what does it mean? He's going to suffer? He's going to be rejected of men? Psalm 118, 22 says, the, the stone which the builders rejected has is, is become the chief of the corner. What does that mean, Lord? And God is just saying, you'll see. In due time, you'll see. Even the angels didn't know. They desired to look into it. Again, do you appreciate the time in which we live? Man, it's amazing. We live in the fullness of time. Galatians 4, 4. We need to appreciate that, what we have right here in the New Testament. Amazing. Yes, sir. It's amazing when you consider that at Jesus' birth, the angels came and worshipped him. And then at the end of his temptation, they come and ministered unto him. And, and they are, it, as your point is, they're saying, this is God in the flesh, and he's going to suffer. Yeah. This is foreign to us. And no doubt, especially because when you get to 2 Peter, which we'll study late in this quarter, but when you get to 2 Peter, the same verse that tells of the angels fall tells of what? Does anybody remember that in 2 Peter 2 or 3? The same verse that tells of their fall tells how they were cast out of heaven. There's no scheme of redemption for angels. You think they view us with some, I don't know if I would say envy, and it's not, that's not the right word, but... You think maybe they view humanity with some wonder and they go, wow, the angels sinned. They were cast out of heaven. That's it. They're consigned to the blackness of darkness forever. But God sent his son? God, God went and dwelt among humans and tabernacled with them in a body and he suffered? And it's all for what? For them to go to heaven and live forever with God. I mean, I have to picture angels sometimes saying, what, what is this? But yeah, I mean, it's amazing. And as it, as it unfolds, you almost just have to see the angels just sometimes breaking out in chorus to God of praise, you know, oh, okay, I get it now. And they just sing a praise to God. Now it's making sense. Now, and... and just amazing the time in which we live. Yes, sir. We, we still have difficulty understanding. We don't understand why God does what He does. The angels don't understand. The only person that really understands is God. Well, we understand the why as far as our salvation, but yeah, there are a lot of a lot of details of the incarnation that will. Uh, you know, one of those things that as Brother Bland used to tell us in preacher school, you have to live right and go to heaven and ask God when you get there because it's. Uh, it is a deep, deep subject. And a lot of people have, uh, have contemplated that and tried to explain it in various ways, and I think those are helpful. But yeah, you're right. There, there's a lot there that, that we don't understand. But uh, let's appreciate the time in which we live. Even the angels looking into this, uh, they didn't fully understand. I, I've even wondered if maybe the angels were almost at the very edge of heaven, as it were, as Jesus is being crucified or as he's being betrayed in the garden and saying, let us go, let us go. We need to stop this. They're not going to put God to death. You, you, you're going to let this happen, Lord? It's almost like they're just, you know, you can almost hear whispers among the angelic host, get ready because he's going to send the signal any minute. He's not going to let this happen. They, they don't understand it. It's still being revealed. What a time we live in. That makes me want to study my Bible more.
to appreciate and to understand more and more as much as I can about this wonderful, wonderful scheme of redemption in this time, this gospel dispensation in which we live. Uh, that's the end of a paragraph there in chapter uh, 1. We'll, we'll look at verses, uh, the next paragraph is 13 to 21, and then we'll finish out 22 to 25. I wanted to cover chapter 1 this morning, but uh, boy, there's some, there's some great thoughts there in just verses 10 to 12 that I think are worthy of our consideration. Thank you for your time. We'll have a break before worship this morning.